So here we go. Uh, we're ready to roll. All right. So our individual, he has a long face. Okay. Uh, so that long face usually means that the ratio of width to height is a little bit more narrowed. Okay. Usually as somebody with a square face, he's almost half and or it's almost the same and the same, but somebody with a little longer face, this gets a little bit more narrowed than this height here, okay? But just as I did with that turquoise line, I'm gonna first start. So that tur turquoise line is like a third of my way. So if I give myself one, two, three, uh, that turquoise line gives me a little space over here. So that gives me one, two, three, and I still have quite a bit of space on my drawing on the left side and quite a little bit of space on my drawing on the right side. I'm gonna be drawing darker than what I would recommend that you guys draw. The reason why I'm drawing this dark is because I want you guys to see the picture on your screens. If I draw lightly like I would in the studio, you guys would have a hard time seeing it. That's usually the big complaint that I get with some of my students. They cannot see the drawing because I'm drawing a little too light. So again, I'm making mine darker just to make it more visible for you guys, okay? So that is my plumb line, all right? That's pretty decent. Uh, I'm gonna find the center of my face, which is not quite center because the, the head actually is tilting, so the back of the head is quite a bit higher. So I'm gonna give myself just enough flexibility to have extra space, okay? So this, if I do half and half, it still gives me a little space to do the back of the head back there. So, you know, my drawing is gonna be well composed, all right? So this is my line of my eyes. I'm gonna measure the blue angle that I did, the blue turquoise angle that I did right there. All right, I'm gonna do the, um, what do you call it, the, the brow line here. And on the brow line, I'm gonna do a, that diagonal line that I did for the center of my face. And what I'm doing here, you guys, I'm actually measuring angles. That's why you saw me do this, but I also did that on my screen, okay? I'm not just measuring one angle and kind of hoping things are fine. I'm actually measuring both angles on my screen. And then I kind of come back and have them replicate. Okay, like I said, mine's a little darker. That way you guys have some space, or sorry, some values to actually see. If you guys are drawing from home, just don't forget, try to draw lighter, okay? I always, always, always recommend a lighter drawing from home, all right? So I have, let's talk about this again. I have the center of my picture, which is my eye to the top. Right now I have no length actually, okay? Then I made my plumb line, okay? That's my plumb line. My plumb line is a straight vertical line, all right? Uh, that's out of the way. Uh, after I made my plumb line, I made my brow line here, and then I did that angle of the face. So the face has a tilt, and this is the angle of that tilt, okay? Now that I have this, it's easier for me to better understand where I could draw my face. So if I just, pick a face that's this long, that my face is that long, I just have to double it. If I pick a face that's a little smaller, let's say my face is this long, then I would just have to double it, and that gives me my height. I'm just gonna go ahead and verify, I'm actually quite correct here, but I'm just gonna go and quickly verify my line. It's actually a little higher right here, okay? Um, so I'm doing something that I don't, usually do. I'm drawing flat. That way you guys can see it on the tablet. Usually my drawings are not flat like this. They're vertical like this. That way I could see exactly what I'm doing. So sometimes I have to come back and verify just to make sure that I'm measuring correctly looking at a diagonal, okay? So I just try to make sure that I'm doing all my correct measurements. So I have my chin. That's going to be my chin. So I could even do a diagonal line to this angle here. 
because that's going to be the base of my chin. And this line could go on forever. I just want to make sure that it's the same angle as this here. Okay, I want to make sure that these are the same angles. These are the same angles. So now the face is gradually at a tilt. If we look at the drawing, the plumb line and the chin do not align, okay? Um, so what happens here is the chin would actually end somewhere about here. Then my plumb line would come up. Sorry, my, my side of my face would come up just ever so subtle. And then it would straighten out just a little bit, ever so subtle. And then it would straighten out just a little bit, ever so subtle, okay? These are just straight lines, you guys. They're not, they don't have the shape of the face, but they have something much more important. They have the placement of the face, okay? Detail is secondary to uh, uh, structure, okay? Composition and structure, are amongst the most important things in drawing. And we have to, have to remember that, all right? Uh, we always forget about our composition. We always forget about how the face should look and we start going too fast into detail, okay? And that's not something that's really recommended or something that's really good, okay? So I'm just measuring this angle here. That's the same distance to that uh, third of the face here. So I'm just gonna do an angle for the hairline and if i remember this line here would actually be another angle right there so that's where my head should end here and if you guys look i'm just doing the same angles that i have in the picture and angles are always correct if they're Remember, they're relative, okay? So if you guys have this angle smaller, this angle uh, more narrow, more narrow, more narrow, it's just gonna be a smaller phase. But if your angles are all correct, it's still gonna be a very good portrait, okay? Don't forget that. All right, so what's the distance from the eyes to the nose? That's usually two-fifths of the way down. So. If I do a marking here, I'm just gonna do a pretty simple marking here. Now we can measure one, two, and a half, okay? His nose is quite long, so it's actually a little tiny bit more than two fifths, but it's very close to that, all right? Don't forget from the eyes here, not from the brow there, okay? So I'm measuring from the eyes here, and I'm just gonna verify one, two, and a half. I'm quite happy where the placement is. And the center of the mouth is roughly a third of the way down from the nose to the chin. Maybe just a tiny bit more, but just always roughly a third. If I measure, it's one, two, almost two fifths. So one, two, and a little bit more. And I'm measuring from the center of my lips, okay? So I'm just gonna do another line. I usually don't draw this structure. I draw a lot looser than this, but I wanna make sure that if you guys don't draw often, you have a good understanding and a good idea of where the face is gonna fit, okay? So we have our angles, we have our placements. Uh, at this point, we could start doing more angles here. Uh, we could start doing the chin. Okay, and here we could do the angle of the head and I'm always measuring. So it so happens that my chin is aligned to the highest part of my head. That's really good. I'm always trying to find these interconnecting angles. And there we go. So my guy is there. The big structure of him is there. And he looks quite correct to me, by the way. 
Uh, obviously, he just looks like angles and like a freeway of lines. But it's okay at this point. That, to me, is all the information that I need in order for me to start rendering, okay? Um, if you guys are not so comfortable with drawing and you guys actually wanted to just take a look at here, remember the video will be up in a few minutes. If you guys want to paint with me and you guys want to drew a little bit beforehand or, you know, got, just got a little comfortable and decided to go with it, by all means, go with it. I know you guys are talented and I know you guys uh, – uh, could do this. The one thing I recommend, if it doesn't work one time, don't try to fix that drawing over and over and over and over again. Shoot a photo. Let me know what's not working. I could advise you better that way. And it's actually okay for you guys to start from scratch, okay? There's no wrong saying that, oh, if it doesn't look good the first time, then you guys just change it until it looks good. You actually become better watercolorist not by doing one portrait, but by doing a thousand portraits, okay? Uh, you don't become good drafters by doing one good drawing that could be luck, that could be not, you know? You become good drafters by drawing over and over and over and over again, okay? Super important to understand that concept. Um, uh, it's not about the one, it's about the many, all right? All right, so I'm sharpening my pencil right here. So if you guys hear a sandpaper, it's my pencil getting sharpened on my sandpaper there. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start free drawing, okay? I'm going to start enjoying my drawing process. I'm going to forget a little bit about all the lines that I have. I'm going to be okay if my lines take a little change for the good. Uh, I'm going to keep still all of this in my head. But now I'm gonna see if I could have a bit more fun, okay? So I'm gonna start with my nose. To me, the nose is the most important thing because the nose will actually structure the, uh, the whole face. The nose is actually not what gravitates somebody towards the portrait. It's mostly the eyes, but it is what gives the portrait the most structure. Most people, uh, most fine art, uh, artists and, and drafters, they'll actually start with the, uh, the brow line, okay? They'll start in this brow area because that has a lot of order and organization to a portrait itself, okay? So once I do this very gentle angle right here, I'm going to go ahead and push a line that goes pretty straight, but it is not a pretty, it's not a perfectly straight line. There is a bone on the nose that we want to make sure that we do. So I made a little break right here. Then I straighten it out again. And then there is a ball on the nose. So the nose actually has a ball or it has a circle. All right, so we want to make sure that we do that ball on the nose. And just make sure that we could relate things. So when I do this ball of the nose, the plumb line here, that's actually where the nose breaks to the nostril. So that's really cool. This is this thing is that plumb line. Oh, that's a phenomenal piece of information because that plumb line just helped me figure out a lot of things. Okay, not just the not just you know where the nose starts and where the nose ends, but also the diagonal and the plumb help me understand where the ball ends and the the nostril begins okay so even 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 rhymes pretty good where the ball ends and the nostril begins all right pretty cool i'm okay all right so now i'm going to use the center of my nose to figure out where my center of my lip is going to go so this is even pretty good because remember, when I did this line here, I didn't do the top lip or the bottom lip. I actually did the center of my lips, okay? So obviously the left lip is gonna be very small and it's gonna end right on the plumb line. The reason why it's very small is because it's at an angle. So everything on the right perceives bigger 
everything on the left perceives smaller. All right. And some of you guys that have seen me watercolor in class, sometimes I don't even draw, okay? I, sometimes I start straight up with watercolor. That is because I draw a lot, so theoretically what I'm doing, I'm still drawing, <laughs> okay? It just looks like I'm not drawing. Like, oh, how do you know where this goes? How do you know where to put this or where to put that? It's like, uh, without drawing, it's like, eh, I'm, believe it or not, even though you're not seeing me draw, I'm still drawing in some way, okay? All right, so I have the big stuff. I have the mouth, I have the, the, uh, the nose. And I'm more concerned, by the way, about my eye socket than I am of my eye itself. The eye is just a part of the picture, okay? It's more important, the eye socket. Oh, before I move on to any further, um, I actually picked this picture to show you how to understand the drawing uh, features, like how to understand those shadows that are very dark. After this watercolor, I actually want to do a softer watercolor, okay? This to me is too dramatic, the picture, the reference that we're using. It's a little too dramatic for watercolor, but it's really good to understand. Um, uh, it's really good to understand drawing, okay? So this, this picture that we're actually using is a better picture for drawing than it is for watercolor. But if you guys do a great job using this picture, later on you guys could just uh, go ahead and change it up a little bit just by using our, just by using the, uh, a softer picture, okay? So I'm using these shadows over here. I'm using this angles to figure out where my right eye goes, all right? He has a little dip on his right eye, kind of melancholic or sad. Right, and if you guys notice, most of the pictures that I pick don't have true emotion, okay? I'm not trying to pick a picture that seems like it's from a photograph. I actually want to pick a picture that feels that it could be from an actual model or not a model, but somebody that hired me for painting, not, not something that I'm using from online. So whenever you guys are doing portraits, it's always recommended that they don't have a lot of features. Usually feature less are better than too many features, right? And this guy just looks pretty serene. He has like a grin, but aside from that grin, he looks pretty kind of featureless or, or emotionless. There we go. All right. So there goes the eyes, there goes the nose. There goes the lips, um, and like I said, I'm drawing a little dark just for you guys to see uh, what I'm actually drawing, um, but everything there looks pretty, pretty good, All right? And don't forget what I said. I'm going to do a good job with the drawing too, okay? I'm not going to do it like a simple drawing. It's still going to be somewhat loose, but I want to make sure that Uh, this guy actually feels like him before I get started, or at least many of the correct angles feel like him. All right. So he's there. Soon his chin is going to get sunken in a bit, so he's kind of thin. So I want to make sure that I sink the, the chin in a little bit, and I'm going to bring in the shape of the face here. His initial drawing, the chin was a little too long. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to subtract. And that's okay. Remember, that is part of drawing. I had a good drawing, but 
maybe this distance is closer to that there. That's much better, all right? So just because I had a good drawing, it didn't mean that everything was set in stone. Angles, angles, thinness. Now I'm gonna go a lot thinner on the hair. Okay, so there he goes, pretty, pretty good. So right now this guy is how this guy would look if he didn't have a beard, <laughs> all right? So you guys know how he looks with a beard because you guys are actually looking at him. But if you guys ever see this character beardless, it's like, I've seen this guy before, I don't know from where. It's like, oh, it's the bearded guy without a beard. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead And just continue the drawing. All right. And if I'm okay with this, I'm okay with the drawing here, I'm, which I am actually okay with it, I'm gonna start breaking in my shadows, okay? If this was, you know, one of you guys that have done portraits over and over and over again, and you guys are super comfortable with this, you don't have to do this, but I also know that many of you guys don't draw portraits all the time. So this is gonna be a benefit, not just for um, this picture, it's a benefit for you guys in the future, okay? So um, even if you guys draw, pay attention to this step, that this step is gonna make your painting a lot better, okay? I don't need a lot of my grids anymore, so if I wanted to, I could actually soften those away. I'm not, I'm not getting rid of them completely because if I would have drawn lighter, I would have actually kept them. But because I'm drawing a little darker for you guys to reference, I'm gonna try to get rid of them, okay? Or at least soften them away. There we go. All right, so he's no longer bound by a grid. He's just the portrait that he is. Um, and let's start breaking in the shadows, okay? Blocking in the shadows is really important. Um, it helps our definition of the face. So this distance that I gave myself there was actually done by my shadow. So this is the nose, the right shadow on the nose plus a little bit of a cast shadow of the nose onto the face, okay? From here, I could see that my nose is a little bit too narrow, so I could fix all this stuff, okay? I could also do the gesture that comes from here and goes to the end of my lip, okay? And I could also figure out the right side of my face. So I could figure out how the right side of my face works and how it's structured. I could also figure out the little bags below his eyes. So remember, last week we discussed that with the dog, the anatomy of it wasn't that important, okay? With a dog, it wasn't about all these kind of perfection things uh, to make him look like dog, I don't know, Theo or whatever. This was more about understanding how to block shadows, and that is what we're doing today, okay? The dog was actually just a little kind of stepping stone for this guy here, okay? So again, I think his eyes were too large. So I'm just gonna narrow them down a bit. That's actually one of the biggest mistakes that we make, that we tend to make our eyes extremely large. And eyes overall 
turn out to be too large. What makes it look large is the shadow above the eye, but not the eye itself. The eye itself should be a little smaller, okay? All right. A lot of the round of the iris is actually behind his eyelid. So again, you don't have to make that very big either. Okay, there we go. Has some detail. Um, now let's finish blocking in texture and values. Okay, so I'm, for the beard, what I don't want you guys to do, I don't want to see this kind of beard or I don't want to see this kind of beard. I want to see the important hairs on the beard that are actually broken from each other. This is a much better beard than that and that. You guys might see like, how in the world is that a beard? I don't see anything that relates to a beard. Well, we'll discuss that, okay? If you guys do something your eye is used to seeing, like a beard, on somebody, even though it's not a lot of information, it's just one or two strokes, your brain will make out that that is a beard, okay? You don't have to give the viewer all the information. You just wanna give them little hints of information. Let the viewer work a little bit, okay? Don't let the viewers get passive. And one of the my most favorite artists to see of implied information or suggested information would actually be John Singer Sargent. He, with one stroke, did uh, uh, a brow, okay? Him with one stroke or a zigzaggy stroke did a fold of a shirt. So he's showing the artist how efficient they can be without actually doing too much, okay? Sometimes we feel that if we do 20 strokes, it's much better. Uh, but in reality, it's about doing a few strokes that are well-placed that work a lot better. Okay, so again, I'm not doing too much. I'm not doing too much at all. I'm just doing enough to suggest that this is a beard. Okay, just suggest that information. All right, good looking guy here. He has his fear. He looks like the guy. He looks like this guy. So if I start painting, I'm going to be okay that he's going to be the sitter that I'm painting. Not if he's John, we don't want him to look like Steve or somebody else. All right, so um, I'm going to separate the hair a little bit. And again, my drawing's still quite loose because I'm very confident with my painting. Sorry, that's my dog. Today I'm working from home, so you'll hear a little bit more stranger sounds, which are common to me because you guys, that's, these guys bark all the time. We've got a bunch of dogs in our neighborhood, so they're always barking at each other, which is okay when you're not sleeping. <laughs> when you're trying to sleep, you kind of go a little nuts, but it's okay. Yeah. All right, so there he goes. He's in the picture, you know, this gentleman of, uh, of I don't know where, um, is actually in the picture. What I'm gonna do, and this again, I don't have to do if I'm very, very comfortable with my watercolor, but I want you guys to do because I, I know you guys don't draw all the time. Um, so this will actually help you. And I know you guys don't watercolor all the time, so this will really actually help you, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two values of darker hatching, okay? One that's gonna block in everything that my eye considers dark, and one that's gonna block in the darkest values, okay? So what I'm gonna do here 
is just give myself a very, very gentle hatching in all my darks. Very light. I don't, basically the reason why I'm doing it very light, I don't want my hatching to influence my watercolor. If I hatch extremely dark, my hatching will influence my watercolor way too much. So whenever I do a light watercolor, it's gonna look dark because of my pencil drawing. And whenever I erase my pencil drawing, my watercolor is gonna go super light because it wasn't supposed to be um, that light in the very beginning. It was just, it would just got a little darker because of my pencil, okay? So you guys have to remember that. You guys do not want your pencil marking to influence your piece too much. All right. Did you guys all get used to your online classes already? No? Yay, nay? Yes. <laughs> Are they as fun as they're in person? They're okay. I, I prefer, to be honest with you, in person classes. Uh, I've also didn't get a lot of experience with online classes. But um, I was like in the beginning of online classes becoming the thing in college. So before me, my older brother never took an online class in, in Cal. Uh, and I took like four online classes and I disliked them all. <laughs> Hopefully mine is not one of those. But the one I'm, I'm giving you guys right now. But yeah, I remember that, uh, I don't know, I wasn't the biggest, biggest fan of the online classes. Maybe also because I was like the guinea pig for the beginning online classes. So I don't know if they were made super dynamic, you know, like very, very fun. They, they don't have to be fun in college, but at least, I mean, if I, if I need to see a PowerPoint, I could do that from, from, uh, from home and not have to go to class. But uh, yeah, I remember they were super dry. Uh, definitely, uh, the main reason why I took like I took Latin American art history, and the art the professor wasn't wasn't in the, in campus. Uh, she was I think in a not a sabbatical year, but she was kind of doing research that semester, so she, she wasn't there. And then I took uh, philosophy class. That one's okay because it was still, you know, a little uh, similar to class. But, um, but yeah, some of the classes were just not too fun online. The only, I, good yeah, go ahead. Part, the only good part is that our tests, we get open book now. Uh, that, that could be good. <laughs> I guess, I guess. They don't want you guys to say, don't open your books, and then like some of the students cheat. But um, yeah, I guess that's that's good. It's, it's good to retain the information though, uh, because sometimes open book questions or open book tests, we might rely too much on the, on the open book itself and not on the studies that we're doing. But uh, yeah, I, I think we, those were some of the 
some of the perks of having the online classes that you could have open book questions. But usually in my classes, when we have open book, it's mostly opinionated. So they know that we have, we're thinking when we're doing the test. Okay. Yeah, so it's more idea-based questions rather than, than copy-paste questions. That's really cool. And uh, so, yeah, so that's pretty much the, the I, was, I was the guinea pig for your guys' online courses, which was really fun, by the way, uh, kind of seeing how everybody was trying to do it differently. Now there's more of a formula that you can use for online courses. But yeah, my sister, she's in law school right now. She's on her um, second year in law school, almost second year. May is her last uh, month and she's going to Georgetown and she just came back. She's staying with my, with my brother because she didn't want to be in DC by herself. Um, and she's having all these online courses, but they're very fun. They're, um, they're still very active. They're still very, very interesting. Uh, but that's also, that has to do with the individuals that teach the classes. And Georgetown has a lot of political law. So they have a lot of, uh, like Supreme courts that give seminars and they're still giving online seminars, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting, I guess, the online system. And even us, we're, we're talking between the instructors. We're considering still having the platform up for whenever you guys are doing makeup cl classes or you guys cannot come into a class, you still have the option. If you guys have a really hard time doing a makeup class, you can still catch up from home. And particularly for students that get sick, which is not what's happening now, but in a way it's correlated to what could happen. You know, if some students are sick, they could work from home instead of working from the studio. So, so yeah, we're trying to keep that, that pretty high. Okay, so that you guys said, I'm pretty much done with what I wanted you guys to do uh, in terms of the hatching and in terms of the drawing. Uh, which gives me a good a good amount of time. I mean, it gives me like an hour of uh, solid watercolor. Uh, is anybody of you drawing right now, or are you guys just observing? Give me a thumbs up if you guys are drawing. <laughs> you guys, because I cannot, I, I don't know what you guys are, are up to on the other side. But if you guys are drawing, give me this guy. All right. If you guys are not drawing, give me... Uh, like a, I'm not drawing face or whatever, <laughs> all right? Uh, I'm, so I'm gonna, uh, if you guys are drawing, just go ahead and continue and wrap this up. I'm gonna set up my watercolor myself. Uh, so I'm just painting on the other side of the, the dog painting here. Uh, so again, I'm gonna put my watercolor here. Uh, I'm gonna pick a even more limited palette than what I have been picking before. Uh, on this side, I have my cup with water. I have my paper towels over here, so you guys cannot see this, but I have this right here, okay? And my water's dirty because I was watercoloring earlier. Uh, I could clean it, but right now I'm trying to not waste too much water, not waste too much paper towels, trying to keep things green, all right? So uh, if you guys are watercoloring with me, uh, I am going to pick such a limited palette for today, okay? And this palette is a super famous palette. This palette is from an artist called Anders Zorn. You guys have um, heard me talk about this. Uh, and Anders Zorn, uh, this is the base palette for 90% of professional artists. I'm making a number up. I'm not sure if it's really 90%. But I, everybody who paints, they use this palette or an alternate version of this palette. As you paint more and more and more and more, and you understand the way this palette works, you could always introduce more colors. You could introduce, introduce emerald green. You could introduce magenta. You could introduce uh, dioxide purple. You could introduce 
you know, a, to blues or whatever you guys want. But usually the introduction of more colors is to uh, skip some steps. That's what it is, okay? But if you guys look at uh, Anders Zorn, I'll put him on the, uh, on one of the computers right now. So he's, he's uh, about 200 years ago, he's long gone. He's no longer, he's no longer around, okay? But if you look at, uh, at his self portraits and the way he painted, he painted really nicely. He painted really classical. These are obviously oil paintings, but just because they're oil paintings, it doesn't mean that his work is strictly bound by oil painting, particularly, particularly talking about the color theory, okay? So if I open up the, the share screen, that's Anders Zorn right there, okay? That guy there. And that's his limited palette. His limited palette is titanium white, which we're not going to use because we're going to use water, okay? Uh, then he has yellow ochre, cadmium red, ivory black. And we, because we're not going to use white and we don't want to work with such a limited palette that's too, too limited, we're going to introduce a blue, okay? I don't mind which blue you guys introduce, but make sure you guys introduce a blue, okay? And this is the self-portrait of him. That's Anders Zorn. This was like taken like 100 or 200 years ago. You might be able to figure that out. Uh, but um, that's kind of out of the question or out of the, the topic. But what we really have to focus on is those three colors, maybe a fourth, okay? Maybe a fifth if you guys so wanted to, but I'm not going to use any more than five colors, and that's going to be my limit. All right, so here we go. So I have my typical uh, brushes here, not, not anything fancy. Remember, I'm not using anything that you guys don't have. So I'm just gonna use two round brushes, no mop brush, just really, really basic stuff. All right, so I'm gonna pick my colors from my palette here, okay? I'm gonna add the water here, you guys can see them. So here's my yellow ochre, I'm just gonna get it active. And again, my tubes or my uh, colors on my wells, they're a little different than these colors on these wells, okay? I actually uh, squeeze mine from actual tubes and they're really rich, but like I said, that's kind of cheating because if you guys don't have access to it, I there's no reason why I should have access to it. So I'm just using the studio material, okay? I'm also gonna use my lemon, which is gonna be this yellow over here. It's gonna be one of my two extra colors. All right. I'm gonna put it on my yellow as well. All right. And I'm gonna use my cadmium, which is this one that looks a little orange, okay? Basically a little bright, warm, Red warm means that it's on the orange family. It's not on the on the uh, purple family. Okay, uh, I'm gonna use my thalo blue here. You guys could use cobalt. You guys could use thalo. You guys could use French ultramarine. I'm just gonna have a blue over here, and I'm gonna use a black. One of the main reasons I'm using blue is to not make my black look like black, okay? I, black and watercolor is extremely flat. So I don't wanna use black as a color. I always want my black to have a little bit of something, okay? So that's my color right there. If you guys see me get different colors at this point, it would just be to make something, it would just be to uh, more colors, it would, just be to refill this, 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 or that, okay? You guys, if you guys have a small portrait, you guys don't need to have a wash, okay? If you guys have a mop brush, you guys don't need to have a wash. I don't have a mop brush and I don't have a small portrait. My portrait is roughly about human size. So what I am gonna do is I am gonna throw a water wash only, okay? Nothing but water on here. Uh, and really quickly, we're gonna start throwing color on there as well, all right? 
So make sure that you guys uh, uh, have your palette ready to go, all right? And what we're gonna do here, let me pick out the image again, sorry, I had the uh, Anders Zorn image still going on my computer. All right, so I am gonna use a tiny bit of my lemon, followed by a tiny bit of a muddy orange, followed by a tiny bit of my yellow ochre, followed by a tiny bit of a warm brown, okay? Uh, this might sound complicated, but because it's a very loose wash, it is actually not as complicated as it sounds. Um, I am gonna uh, take my picture on, sorry, I haven't done that yet, but I am gonna take my picture on, that way it doesn't kind of fold as I'm paint, as I'm watercoloring, that way it stays nice and flat. And, you guys don't see a funky looking guy because you might start getting all funny looking as my paper starts to warp. All right, there we go. I think we're good. I think he's ready to be painted on. All right, so what I'm gonna do right now because I have a cold pressed paper, it takes water very well and I have um, a bigger portrait, uh, I am gonna use just the pure water. If you guys had a brush like this, you guys could use this. I'm gonna use this just for the wash, not for the painting, because I don't wanna spend too much time just adding water in this thing. All right, so I'm just gonna throw some nice water. And I don't want the puddle, okay? If you guys do a puddle, you, your color's gonna take forever to dry. So I want uh, even, but kind of thinly apply watercolor. Because remember, I'm also gonna make my colors watery too, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna come with my lemon yellow. Whoa, there's a lot of color in the bottom of my palette there. All right, I forgot to clean my brush when I was picking up the colors, all right? So I'm gonna come with my lemon yellow and just kind of map in the areas around my light source. And don't panic here. If your color is a little too intense, it's not necessarily that your color is too intense, it's just that that's the only color that's in your picture, okay? So color is relative. Right now your yellow is relative to your white. So obviously enough, it looks to be um, super yellow, but that's because I haven't applied anything else on my picture, okay? I don't have to throw too much of this color. I don't think there's, there's enough to really feel concerned about adding a lot of this color here. Let me erase just a little bit from there. Okay, so I'm gonna go really quickly into my yellow ochres with a little cadmiums and a little blacks. Never have your color seem straight out from the tube. Never have it uh, too muted either, but I wanna make sure my color feels right. It feels real, it feels light, but real. All right. A little bit of orange here. And remember, these colors are very light. They're very conservative. And see, all of a sudden, my yellow is disappearing. Some people will say, whatever happened to your yellow? It's like, it's there. It's just in comparison to the new yellow, it's really muted. my new color has just become quite a bit important and quite a bit influential on my picture. And some of my graphite is picking up. I, that's one of the reasons why I prefer to work on a, uh, a little lighter than this and not work too much with graphite, uh, just because it'll pick up. It's natural for it to pick up. Um, but if I were doing a portrait of somebody that I was paying for this portrait, I would probably go
go with a lighter graphite just to make sure that his portrait doesn't look too gray. And then right now that's what's happening, that the, um, the, the graphite cold is actually picking up quite a bit. But as long as you guys know that, just don't do that often. All right. So I'm gonna do a little cooler red on the nose. And again, very fun. So I'm trying to show a difference between my cold values and my warm values. And by the way, cold values could be light as well. So I'm gonna throw in this grayish pink here. And my portrait is quite muted, but I do have my high chroma colors. High chroma are your bright colors, not your muted colors, even though it is a little muted because of the, of the uh, graphite pencil. But I don't mind it. This is the only color that I'm seeing here, okay? I'm not seeing a desaturation of color. I'm not seeing grace. I'm just seeing color here. Right. Have fun here. Make sure you guys use your high chroma colors. That there is obviously gray, this portion here, but doing the gray portion is really simple. It's doing the color that we forget. And I'm reminding you just not to forget. All right. So my character is looking fine. To me, he's not looking bright enough, which I'm going to try to add some brights in a second. I'm going to use that yellow ochre for the hair. I feel his face might actually be a little too long for my taste, but I cannot actually notice that because, like I said, I'm working flat, which I usually never do. Uh, I always try to work my watercolor at an angle, but because I want the image to be flat here, uh, I am getting a bit of a perspective that I might not actually be able to notice on my end. But when I stand up, he does his face does look a little long. Uh, I'm okay with that. I understand where the problem happened, and I'm fine. I mostly draw on a drawing horse, so my pictures are more accurate. I'm going to try to make his head broader. All 
right? All right, here we go. All right, so I'm just blocking in. The background is not that important. That's what I haven't been talking too much in this port part. I just feel that it's a little yellow first and then a little cooler later. Okay, but before I move on to the next step, which is gonna be defining my shadows a little better, I am gonna go in here and define a little bit more of my brighter chroma colors, okay? I don't think it's they're quite there in the picture. I think my bright chroma colors are actually quite muted. Okay. And I'm gonna try to bring this light into the picture and desaturate these colors later. All right. So my picture will be wet for a bit of time. I am using quite a bit of, of water, so I don't need to worry about my picture not you know being ready to work or active. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the brightest colors now. I could start with the yellow one. It doesn't really matter where I start. Um, but I'm just going to come in and brighten the intensity of the picture. And I know later on, these colors are going to go away to some extent, OK? But they're not going to go away a lot. So I'm trying to bring in my high chroma. And the, the most important one is not the yellow that I'm drawing, drawing. The yellow is actually my minority of the color. It's actually the red. The red is the color. And right now I'm just throwing color. Don't forget, I'm not throwing detail or anything of that sort. It's just it's strictly color. There's my dog again, and he's here, or I'm with them today, so he's going to be extra yappy here. And now I'm going to be more careful, but I'm going to start with my more orange color and then gr gradually migrate into a more purple color. So if this thing looks like it's on fire right now, that's a good sign because I could later gray. What I could not do later is I cannot bring this bright colors back into the picture. All right, so right now it might look like it has a lot of brights. It might look like it's just a bit too intense, but don't worry, we'll substitute those with grays later. She has a pink eye right now. So I'm going to do the colors around the eyes, a little bit more orange. And I'm going to do the colors around the nose and the forehead a little bit more cold, so a little bit more purple, you could say. All right. So I'm just building up, building up making things a little more intense. All 
All right. And even if this looks wrong right now, it's okay. You're not gonna have another time to add these brighter colors. So if you guys don't do this now, it's you're gonna have a small window to do this later, but it's such a small window, I don't recommend you do these later. I recommend you do this now. Okay, that looks pretty good. So now I'm gonna do my purplish reds. So I'm gonna add my red next to that blue or to the black, it doesn't really matter. They're both cold at the end. All right, very thin. And I'm doing it very thin because the purple color, it's actually quite light. It is purple, but it's not dark. Or it is cold, but it's not dark. If you guys have ever seen the works of Norman Rockwell, uh, American painter, did all those kits that are always in the medical office. Uh, so Norman Rockwell, he always did a stripe of brighter reds along the nose, just to show that those kids always had that kind of stuffy nose, you know, really nice looking, by the way, really, really well done portraits, but really fun and funny the way he would always do that, that stripe of bright color, just to show that those kids always had this runny nose. All right. So I like it and my nose might be a little more colorful. It, it actually is not, let me rephrase that. My nose might perceive more colorful than in the picture, but it is actually quite correct, okay? That's the right terminology for that. Right now is that you guys cannot compare it to anything. So you guys are just comparing it to, um, the other light colors that I have here, but when we start adding those really dark values, which is gonna be our next step, it's not gonna be a really dark values, but there are gonna be quite a bit of darkness to them. You guys are gonna see where the other variation of color actually worked perfectly fine. Right now, it's weird that the left side looks as light as the right side. But again, that's because we don't have any values to compare. The more we paint, the more values that we give it, the better it's going to be. Be patient, okay? Patient and patience is a virtue, and it's a good one. All right, that looks pretty good. He looks pretty colorful. He looks uh, quite well. I'm gonna throw a photograph of this painting process. <clears throat> so I'm really quickly just gonna take a photo of this just for you guys to see how I'm layering. If you guys cannot see very well on the, uh, on the tablet, okay? Um, I forgot one color. I forgot the eyes, and I'm gonna go ahead and do those right now. I'm just gonna add a little bit of the yellow ochre to my black and my blue. Completely forgot about that. So I'm not gonna do the heavy green color on my eye. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm gonna do my yellow color right now. And I'm not concerned about the twinkle. I'll rip that off just like I showed you with the dog. And I'm just doing that, okay? Do you guys have any questions at this point? You guys are okay? Okay. 
All right. Once I do this step, I'm just gonna do one last step for today because this this I'm doing quite fast, but it might actually take you guys a good a good deal of time to do correctly. So our class today is gonna be like till eight forty five because uh, the next step is gonna take a bit of time. But I don't want you guys to rush at home, okay? I actually want you guys to take your good old time. Um, so after I'm done with this next step, I'm gonna work a little bit more on the portrait. And then I think that's gonna be it for, for today. Uh, if you guys are working or you guys have any questions, please let me know. I'm just talking because I gotta let this dry, <laughs> all right? So if I, um, if I start working right now, if you guys don't dry your brush, your watercolor will always be too wet. The color will always be bleeding and it's gonna seem like a never ending story, okay? It's gonna seem like he's the softest person you guys have ever seen. And it's actually easy to make this person soft just by doing thin layers at the end. It's a lot harder to make them look structured later. So my brush strokes are still gonna be quite square today, okay? or they're gonna be quite square now. All right, so here we go. So I'm gonna pick a little more intense color. I'm gonna dry my color really often, by the way. Do anything that I feel is it's incomplete. Sorry. Sorry again. There was some bleeding in the eye. So here we go. So my color's a bit more dry now, but it still has a lot of color, okay? It's not very desaturated. The problem if I use a very desaturated color now, it's gonna make my picture very flat once I start adding the grays. And I know that this color is still quite light. It looks dark because it's darker than the previous color, but in all reality, it's not that dark. So now I'm adding a little reds into my color. And this color later on is gonna get a lot more gray, but right now I'm not looking for the a lot more gray color. I'm looking for the nicer color. So it's oranges plus black. It's beautiful green colors. I'm gonna do more of that purple, red. If my color's too wet, I'll dry my brush. Okay. Super, super saturated. And again, I know this is gonna be more gray. really high chroma. And the cool thing of that dramatic portrait is that now I'm beginning to see the dark and the light or the chiaroscuro.
but remember, don't forget that I'm still doing my blocky strokes, okay? I'm not doing thin strokes. Everything is still quite blocky. So now I'm gonna do a more green color. So I'm gonna go back to my yellow ochre. But I'm gonna start bringing some black into it. So this is gonna green down my color really beautifully. There we go. So not all the gray colors are warm. Some of the gray colors are actually cool. And these are still fairly light colors, you guys. That's why I'm using them so loosely that I don't see these as dark colors. They are a darker version of the previous color, but that doesn't make them a dark color. That's why I'm still going over many things. But my little character is coming out. And if you guys look at the first drawing class that we had, I'm using the basic techniques from the first drawing class to do the shadow colors. Those basic techniques just tell me that I have to value the eye socket the side and the base of the nose, the top lip, the shadow below the lip, and the chin. He doesn't have a visible chin, so I don't have to darken that. But most people that uh, you could see the chin, you would actually want to darken that in a bit. Again, don't freak out if you see these colors to be too dark. They're just darker than the previous ones, but they're not that dark. They're darker and they're brighter. Okay. And, you know, in the bigger picture of things, I think I'm, I'm okay. I think I have um, reached a good intensity when it comes to values. All right, and anything that's missing, go and hunt for it too. All right, I'm missing some yellow here. All right, throw some yellow there. Oh, I'm missing some yellow there. Throw some yellow there, okay? The left eye is just completely unpainted. So let's throw some something, something. Isn't that too intense? No. Are you gonna desaturate it? Maybe. Am I scared if I don't desaturate it quick enough? No. Okay. And the main reason why I'm not scared of doing anything is that I know it's practice. And that's why this thing is gonna come out pretty well because I don't have any um, uh, goal in terms of placing it in the house or anything. My goal is to understand and to execute. And that gives me a lot of liberty. Whenever you guys start working more professionally and you guys do portraits for your friends and so forth, you'll see that there's going to be a different kind of tension and it's going to be, um, you know, a little stressful, but that's going to happen in the future. Once you guys are good at your techniques right now, we're still working on techniques. So like I said, our expectations are there, 
but they shouldn't be to sell or any of that sort of stuff. Your expectations are to practice, okay? And you know, those are gonna be high expectations for my part, because I always believe practice makes perfect. And if you guys practice well, you guys should be able to do a pretty good job later. Okay, so what I just did is gonna take quite a bit of time on your guys' end, okay? Uh, I'm pretty sure if we're having a two hour class, this is already way over the two hour mark, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna render a little bit more on this part. If you guys have, I know you guys are at home right now for the obvious reasons, if you guys have more time, continue to work more, uh, continue to take initiative. But if you guys only get to this and then you guys get a little lost, stop at here. That's okay. This is not like those other watercolors that we're trying to kind of finish them in one class. These are going to be a little bit more rigorous. These are going to be a little bit more difficult. Okay. So when you get to this part, I'm okay if you guys just wait for next week, but I'm also okay if you guys actually try to do some more work. And if things are not going your way, later on ask me, why didn't things work out for me? What was happening? What went wrong that I couldn't quite pinpoint? You know, that's, that's fine. That's, that's, you know, that's part of the work in progress, okay? So if I have all the colors that I want, which I have the big majority of them, by the way, I could start rendering, right? Again, I will probably let my picture dry for a few minutes here. I'm not letting my dry because I want to, I kind of want to show you guys what I mean with this extra work. And I'm only going to work in this area here. Uh, I should be working on the bigger watercolor, but that's fair enough, okay? I'm going to take a really quick photo of this. So, whenever you guys remember what was the second layer, this photo would be the second layer. All right. Here we go. All right. Here we go. All right, now we're gonna start neutralizing the color. So before the blues were scarce, okay? We were not using the blue and the, and the um, black as a main color. Now we're gonna start using the blue and the black as a main color. Um, everything else will become a minority, but the fun thing is that it's already in the picture, okay? So even though it's a lot less, these colors are already in the picture. So I'm going to start by making myself a grayish green. Okay, so I'm going to use black over here. And I'm just going to add a little bit of yellow to it. And this color is actually going to complement the red because green is opposite of red. So even though the color looks a little more green on my palette, whenever I start using it here, it's just gonna look like a darker value. But if you guys actually look in my palette, it's a very, very beautifully done green. But if you guys look at my painting, it's a black. Color is perception or color is perceived. If you guys have a lot of uh, warms and you add a blue to it, that blue is gonna stick out like a sore thumb because it's perceived different than all the rest that you guys are doing. And believe it or not, this is not my darkest value. This is just still in the middle of the pack. 
never commit, if you guys go straight into black, you, you encounter yourself with two problems. One, black likes, looks like a delineation, so it looks like an actual outline, which is not good. And two, you guys are over committing. So if you guys are unsure if what you did is right or is the right that you guys are looking for, and you guys are using black, then it doesn't matter because by using black, you guys are making sure that you have committed to it. So even if it's not right, there's no going back. All right, so I'm gonna use a little bit of a bluish gray. Just to gray this area around the eye. So I would eventually do the same thing to the other eye. Sorry, it's my wire shade of question. All right, going back to that blackish green. It's just giving me ever so subtle some more depth, but I'm still trying to keep the color. And have fun with color, you guys. That's really important. Don't just paint black and white. That's that's like my beef with my students. I always tell them, what, what in the world is going on to your shadows? They're just black. I was like, yeah, that's the color of the shadows. Like, no, color of shadows is actually not black. It's the actual color plus complementary color. All right. Here we go. And because I started this part, I do have to finish this other part over here. There we go. 
a little bit more volume onto my guy. I'm just calling him the guy because I don't have an idea of who he is. I just like the lighting of him. So my guy is getting pretty cool values. All right. So I'm actually quite happy. You know, I'm not, like, okay, like I said, happy is not the same as being done. But I'm actually quite happy with the way the valleys are bleeding. I'm quite happy with the way color is getting built up. The way the color is getting rendered a little bit more. And I think that is good for today. I think this is actually a lot of work for you guys to do in two hours or three hours, okay? I spend about uh, an hour and 35. I spend, you know, somewhere around there talking a bit, but I know that you guys are not going to be talking too much because you guys are probably going to be working uh, from home, but make sure... If you guys have any difficulties with your drawing, please send me your drawing before you guys start watercoloring. I'm gonna take the longest that I'm gonna take, it's probably gonna be a day, uh, but I'm probably gonna have it done before a day, okay? So please, if you guys are unsure if things are going in the right direction, send me an email, show me the photo that you guys were working. If you guys start watercoloring and the drawing is still quite off, I cannot change that, okay? I could change the drawing, but I cannot change the watercolor too much, unless you guys do it very light. But even if you guys try to do it very light, I would just recommend that you guys um, leave, you know, the, the watercolor part till after you guys are done with your drawing parts, okay? I'm gonna do something real quickly because this has to be done. I'm just going to go into my knife and gently rip my paper to expose a highlight. If you guys had masking fluid, you guys could do this with your masking fluid instead of ripping your paper. Um, masking fluid protects any light. But if you guys don't mind ripping the paper, then you have some little highlights. Okay, you guys? Um, do you guys have any questions? Because that's all I'm doing. I know this is going to take you guys a bit of time. Let me know if you guys have any questions. He looks a lot brighter already. I'm just going to put this out. He looks a lot brighter than the picture, okay? But I could always do my neutral colors later, okay? So he has more reds than the picture. He has more oranges than the picture, particularly here. But later, these colors are going to turn neutral, okay? And a bit darker. Um, so if you guys don't have any questions, let me know. And if not, I'll end the meeting. Okay. Anything, anybody, nothing, maybe so. <laughs> All right. You guys are my quiet class. All right. So if you guys don't have any questions, I think we're going to be able to call it a night. Have a good weekend. Work on this. If you guys get stuck, let me know. You guys can email me at any time. I know during class, I'm more able to work hands on. Right now, I don't have the luxury of working too much, too much hands on with you guys. So please let me know if something has you stuck, if something is not quite working out like you guys were wishing to be or do. Uh, but the only way I could figure that part out is if you guys email me. If you guys don't, then I'm assuming everything is going quite fine, okay? So if you guys don't have any questions, have a great weekend, you guys. Stay safe at home. Uh, um, don't go out, you know, still quarantine for a bit. And uh, hopefully we get to see you guys soon. Uh, we don't have a actual set date, but hopefully it'll be by May. All right, you guys? Well, take care. Uh, have a great week, and we'll see you later, all right? Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye.